Hello, I'm Brigham Avery. Welcome to Hollywood and Ivy, where Sunset Boulevard meets Addison and Clark, the show where we get to know celebrity cub fans from the entertainment world as we take you from Wrigley Field to the red carpet. Today, Hollywood and Ivy welcomes an accomplished and unforgettable character actor of television and motion pictures, a man whose career spans over 35 years and whose roles in Office Space, Dodgeball, The Brady Bunch Movie, Veep, and NCIS make him as recognizable as Cubby Blue. Born in Chicago, veteran of the Steppenwolf Theater, and lifelong Cubs fan, welcome Gary Cole. And today we welcome actor Gary Cole. Great to have you here, Gary. Thanks, Thanks so much for having for me. For making having time. Me. How did you begin your love affair with the Chicago Cubs? Was it was it love at first sight growing up in Chicago? It was, uh, and probably like a lot of uh, young boys, uh, my father introduced me to the Cubs. He had been a Cubs fan as a as a kid, actually went to the 1945 World Series, which was the last time they were in the World Series before, uh, I believe, 2016. And uh, so I guess my first game would have been 65, somewhere around there, 1965, nine or 10 years old. And uh, the place struck me. That's the first thing that struck me. You know, you hear that story all the time. You come up the stairs and you see, you know, you see a lot of green uh, and, yeah, it uh, it stuck with me and never never has left. You know that that love. Now, now growing up, did you uh, imitate one of the Cubs in your backyard? Did you pretend to be in the, in my neighborhood? We played a lot of uh, baseball in the street or wiffle ball, and we would we would do batting stances of the entire lineup. Mm -hmm. You know, and we would try to guess each other's who we were doing. Ernie Banks was the easiest because he had the very oh, yeah. distinctive finger moving and, and uh, those strong wrists. Right, yeah. right. Um, so we did. We were, you know, we we were always designated. You know, we we would choose who we would be before we would start to play. Yeah. Would you say that Wrigley Field, Gary, is the best place in the world if you'd like to play hooky from school, or perhaps <laughs> from the office? Well, it is. It but but the problem with that is that you know. You, you risk the, the chance of being on television <laughs> and being seen. Could be a problem. Yeah, yeah. although that was never a, uh, never an issue. And I didn't play hooky that many times. I think there was one one situation where we actually were supposed to be in school or at the ball game. But oh. I think we got, we got, we escaped. The cameras under, didn't find you? No, we no? escaped undetected. I'm yes. so glad. Yes. Uh, you said 1969 was a very special team and uh, a special summer for you. Did you go to a lot of games that year? Is there a... I probably in 1969 went to at least four or five games. Yeah, um, I lived in a suburb about 35 minutes from Chicago, uh, but my father was very excited about the team because it had been a long time since it it felt real that they were really going to be contenders. They had been in my memory they they were pretty good in '67 and in '68, better than they had been. Uh, Since the 40s. Right. I mean, but even in the early 60s, they were pretty, pretty Dreadful. bad. Dreadful. Yeah. Pretty bad. Yeah. yeah. When the black cat crossed Ron Santos' path at Shea Stadium in September. Do you, do you remember that? And, and I watched every game from Shea Stadium on my little black and white television about this big. And uh, Jack Brickhouse narrating the whole thing. And uh, with, with each successive loss in that series. I don't know if they lost every game in this series. It seems like they did, but it's where they shifted. It's it was they, the beginning of the end. Yeah, it's where yeah. they lost the lead of the, mm -hmm. of the, uh, of the division, and, and, um, and it, it didn't look like it was going to get any better after that, no. Were you, were you a big uh, Wrigleyville guy, a big bleacher guy in 69 and growing up? In the late 70s and early 80s, I actually lived in the neighborhood. I, I lived about three blocks north of the ballpark on Clark and Racine. And I, I frequented the bleachers a lot. And these, at, in those years, it was not a big deal to, you know, score some, score a seat anywhere in the ballpark, let alone the bleachers, because uh, it, there, were, there were days when it could be pretty sparse. So, um, so I spent a fair amount of time at bleachers. But I think at the last time I was at the bleachers, I was probably 25 or 26, yeah. See, were you there before they put the fence in and people used to do that? They'd walk along the edge, as I've, I've heard. I was there you know? before. I, they put the that fence. That was a legend. They put the fence in, I, I want to say it was during the 69 season or maybe the season after, because they had a lot of 
problems with the bleacher bums dancing on the yeah. on the top and people, you know, deciding Falling to, to dive bomb the outfield. Yes. Uh, so I I think I'd been out there once or twice before the fence went up, but I can't. I, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure what the actual, actual date is of that. The next time the Cubs were competitive after '69, specifically 1984. Right. What was your memory of that? Were you a big Samber guy? A big fan of the. Uh, well, again, cubbies. you know, uh, uh, success returned in a way that was, oh, my God, I really? Are th this is a really good team. But now, with some experience as a Cub fan, there a was always... A little bad taste in your mouth. There was always the lurking, yeah. you know, reality that, yeah, yeah, they're looking good, but it's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> uh, but they were so good, and they were so good at home. Um, they had a lot of weapons. They had really good pitching. And that's when I lived, you know, in the early part of the 80s. I think I was still there in 82, so that, that team was emerging. But I was still living in the city, not far from the ballpark. So the buzz was the buzz was big, and people were getting roped in once again. Would you watch the Sandberg game, and did you really kind of— I watched the Sandberg game. I feel like game. that was kind of the, the beginning of the roping in for Well, I knew that that's that, that was— the believing started. That was pretty extraordinary. I don't know if I have this right, if that was when— <clears throat> if they overtook the Mets or the Cardinals, or I, I can't remember if they... They didn't overtake them. They uh, actually, but Sandberg had tied the game twice. Right. And it was against Bruce Sutter. But in the standings. So I don't know if that was a standing They actually switch or took not. over first place on August the 1st, 1984. Okay. But they, yeah. they were right there. So they kind of... Yeah. It, it no, was that a big game, game was because... extraordinary. And, they, and obviously, because they call it the Sandberg game, yeah. you can tell what kind of a performance uh, he had. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. Your opinion on the significance of that day? It seemed like... That game was kind of a, a benchmark in the season that said, this could happen. We're contenders. Yeah, because if, if my memory is true, the lead changed a lot in that game. And I know, was that was the game in July? Or it was uh, June 23rd. Thank you, Jim. So, All I got to do is edge. check with you. Uh, but I think it, 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 it gave me, and I'm sure every Cub fan, you know, that season, confidence that this this team was for real and that they weren't going to roll over. Yeah. You're watching Hollywood and Ivy. We'll be back with more after this. Stick around. Welcome back to Hollywood and Ivy. Today we're visiting with Gary Cole. So, Gary, not a lot of people remember this, or it's been a long time since this, but no lights or lights in Wrigley Field was a very big thing for many years, including 1984. Were you a big lights or a, a no lights guy? Did you have a big opinion about that? I was curious about what Wrigley Field at night, because for years you'd seen it, you, you, couldn't, in, you couldn't imagine it in any other way except sunshine. Or even seeing lights at Wrigley Field, that was amazing to see during a day game. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it was, yeah, it was kind of one of those things that it was, it was tough to process, you know. But uh, now it's, you know, now it's just secondhand. You know. Do you have a, a favorite Cub player of all time? Early on, it was always, it was always Ernie Banks. Um, but as the, the team became uh, a real contender in 69, I kind of looked at the team as, as a cast of characters. And so I remember everybody in the starting lineup, and they were all you know, on a given day, the hero, you know, and uh, Jack. In fact, that's a great way to, to yeah, see if you have a contending Yeah, and Jack Brickhouse, team. who was the announcer, w was, was really responsible for that. I mean, he, he really, narr you know, he really told that story. Uh, and you had, you had a sense of, of these guys together and, you know, how one day somebody, you know, would, would, would not be able to come through, but somebody else would pick them up. And, and so then it became more of this, these guys, you know, this, this, this cast of characters that would, you know, go out there and, and try to, you know, bring back the W. Did you ever meet Harry Carey? I never met Harry yeah. Carey. I did, though, meet Jack Brickhouse because Jack Brickhouse attended a play that I did uh, in Chicago in, like, he, I think he had already... Maybe he hadn't retired from the Cubs yet. I think he was right on the edge. It was in 1980, so I, you you may know. You may it was, know. The I think it was one of his. I think probably his second to last. Second year. to last yeah, season, because yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Harry yeah, was 81 80. was his last, and uh, okay. I think so it was. No, he was still. He was still the broadcaster. He was still the Cubs broadcaster. So that was a thrill. I couldn't believe I had met him. It was one of the first celebrities, you know, so called that I had ever met in my life. 
Uh, and I was like, you know, I was just jazzed yeah. from it. Do you have a, a favorite Cubs pitcher of all time? Well, again, I go back to the, you know, you go back to your childhood and you, you that's what you first identify baseball with is, are those players, Ferguson Jenkins, who I also met uh, uh, one time because he, in I think it was in 69, he was doing the rounds of talking to little leaguers, and I was in little league, and uh, he he came to some high school and oh wow did a did a Q and A and a thing, and we all you know were able to ask him questions, uh-huh. and sign sign balls and stuff like that. So that was big. That was a big thrill to him. Did you have a favorite player from the '84 team specifically? Anybody stick out in your mind? Well, Sandberg, obviously. I, I thought Sutcliffe was great. Not only because he was a great pitcher, but because from time to time he would hit home runs, which was Mm-hmm. Which was fun, um, and uh, you know those are the two standouts to me from that team. But that was again, you know, a really solid team. Uh, when the Cubs won it all in 2016, did you have a? There, was there a group text going with you and Joe Montaigne and Gary Sinise and a bunch of other Cubs fans? How did you? Did you guys talk about it a lot? Did you guys? It, you know, well, I saw the end of the game so late, and I went to work the next day, and then it was all with with uh, my buddy Kevin and, and a lot of other people that you know were not were not Cub fans, but were certainly you know, aware that of the situation with the Cubs. So, yeah, it was, it was like I said, I, 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 I was really kind of off balance the next day. I went right back to work, got up early, and I still couldn't believe what had happened. You know, it was all over every day. I mean, the, the last, you know, the last play was probably played Brian a hundred, hundred times that day, yeah. you know, and now we all know the famous little slip of, yeah. of Bryant. Yeah. Where you go, no, His no. Cle- yeah, just, yeah. Boy, you, you know. really... Yeah. Yeah. I was taping the game at home and I didn't want to know anything. But of course, you get too curious. And I was working with a couple of other Cub fans, Kevin Dunn for one, who I've known for 30 years. So the score of the game kept surfacing. And we worked until about probably the seventh inning or the or and then there was a giant rain delay somewhere in there. At, at, actually, there's in like game seven. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, the, the, all I knew was that they were behind and that they had gone into the locker room. I think that's correct. When they were, they were behind when they, they were, were in the tied. locker room, they were, they tied. were tied. Okay. Yeah. So, and then I came back and I was by myself. I oh, mean, God. I was, I just came home and I, I turned it, turned it on and picked up at the rain. I, I fast forwarded through, even though I hadn't seen the game, but I knew where it stood. So I wanted to get to where, you know, what what I what I knew was the score and where they were, so I took it to there and watched alone, like this, like a lot of people. Yeah. And they won, and I I I just kind of stood there, and uh, I mean I stood up from the couch. I probably was standing the whole last half of the inning, and uh, I I I don't know that I wept, but I certainly got uh, teary eyed. Yeah. I would say this. I would say it's not the best thing that's ever happened to me, talking about Game 7 in 2016, but it's the best thing I've ever seen. Like for three hours, if I were, three and a half hours, I were to take that window of time, yeah. look at that. That's say, a good wow. way to put it. Yeah. Right? Would you agree? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I would. Yeah. And then, of course, I had to go back and watch the entire game, even though knowing the outcome. So, um, And that was fun to do because I was like, I, I, I could remove all the anxiety and know what the, you know, what the result was going to be. It was joyous, but it was also like, the, the the earth shifted a little bit, you know. I felt in 2003, I'd like to get your opinion on the Bartman game and everything about that specifically, but I felt right <laughs> as that was leading up, Gary, right, right, I felt my system of beliefs is about to collapse because the Cubs are about to do something I never thought they could do. Nobody thought they could do. They're five outs away, and holy cow, I don't know how to feel. But in 2016, I was ready. I feel I was ready. I don't know if, you know, how you felt about 2003, where you were for that. I'm not trying to make it painful for Oh, you. no, no, no. <clears throat> I had a strange circumstance with that. I was watching the game, and but that evening I happened to have concert tickets. To, to who? Who are you going to go see? Neil Young. Oh, wow. No, sorry, scratch that. James Taylor, not Neil Young. Ah. Um, <laughs> and I had to go pick up somebody to get to bring to the concert. So I left the game, and I said... I was watching on television. I was here. Mm-hmm. So I decided that I would not listen to the rest of the game, and later I would come home and 
and, and watch the entire game. Right. But it was, when I left, it was prior, it was at the fifth inning? Was this the, the, the nightmare the of The eighth Bartman inning is when everything went eighth to, inning. Uh, okay. yes. Right. I don't know why I say details. I should just no, ask. No, I should just ask <laughs> you first. good. So I leave, but I could not help myself. I turn the radio on. Oh. And all you hear is, five outs away, oh, oh my no. God, the yeah. Cubs yeah. in 100 years, 1908, yeah. da, 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 it's going to be glorious. Yeah. And then... Yeah. And then there's a foul ball down the left field line. Right. Oh! Yeah. Uh, Moises Olu is, he's just beside himself. And oh, did and a fan then, and then that it just, ball? and I'm waiting, yeah. he's sitting in the car alone, hearing, I can feel the air being sucked oh. out of Wrigley Field. And I know what's coming. I thought you were going to say James Taylor announced during the concert, hey, I've seen fire and I've seen rain, and I've never seen the Cubs win the pennant because they lost. You're watching Hollywood and Ivy. We'll be back with more after this. Stick around. And welcome back to Hollywood and Ivy. Today we have the pleasure of visiting with Gary Cole. Now, Gary, how did you first get into acting? I started pretty early. My sister was a, uh, a performer and a musician in high school. So she did... She did some plays, but, but predominantly played in the, in the orchestra pit quite a bit for musicals and stuff like that, variety shows. And so that's the first time I went to the theater, or theater at all, of any kind. And uh, I was immediately, you know, I, I immediately liked the environment. And what I remembered was, I thought to myself, I... I I would much rather be up there as opposed to sitting here watching that. And then that, that, that's, that was the bug. That was the only the thought bug. I had, but it was, it was powerful enough that I, you know, soon after that got involved as well. I was about 15, I guess. When you first created <clears throat> the character of Lumberg in Office Space, did you know what you were getting into? How, how did that all come about with the, with the monotone voice and just everything you, you, you made with that? Well, I, I, I always love to say that I that I invented that, but I invented nothing. That, ah. was, that was a uh, an animation done by Mike Judge mm -hmm. that, and I'm not sure that Mike actually voiced that character, but he did, he did, a, uh, he did like three, two or three animations that first appeared, I think on Saturday Night Live, early 80s or mid 80s, mm -hmm. or maybe even MTV. Mm -hmm. One one was Lumberg, the other one was Milton. Right. He, he voiced Milton. Right. He may have voiced Lumberg too, but I'm, I don't. I'm not. I may be wrong about that. But that's where it all came from. And so when I went in to meet him, everybody that went to meet him got these got tapes of these uh, these animations. Mm -hmm. And when I watched it, I I decided immediately. Well, I can't do it better than that. And I can't do anything that is better than that, so I'll just do that. <laughs> and he seemed to think that was a good idea when I did it. And he was like, oh, that's great. Yeah, well, it's what you did. So, <laughs> so I ripped it off with permission. Yeah. Do they recognize you at Wrigley Field? Do people... You I've know, been, yeah, I've, I've, I've had Lumberg you shouted out. at me oh, yeah? through the crowd at, at Wrigley. Yes. Oh, really? Yes, like, I have. And, and do they shout anything else? Do they recognize you? No, from they, you know, they, it's, it, it, there's always a TPS report, oh, yeah, request, yeah. sure. Or, or they let me know that they're going to come in on Saturday, or I need to come in right. on Saturday. Sure. That's good. Did you ever sing the seventh inning stretch at Wrigley Field? I have not done uh -huh. that yet. No, it's through just laziness or scheduling, or you know, mm -hmm. never being there when when it was convenient to do. So, I'm hoping to make that happen at some point. Do you have a memory of a performance that's outstanding? I like to think about Mike Ditka in 2003 <laughs> in the cut, right? You know what I'm saying? Well, it's hard to beat Mike Ditka. You know, when he's feeling good. Yeah. You have a really nice monotone voice. Have you ever thought about uh, announcing, maybe? You'd be a <laughs> hell of a, a, a brick house or perhaps a Bob Costas. I. And you played one in Dodgeball, so you've already did. done I it. I did. I did. And uh, I listen, you know, I, I watch, you know, I watch the Cubs constantly, but I watch, you know, I watch baseball a lot in general. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I fantasize about having that job, you know. Um, there's just something about it. it it's so um, kind of cerebral, and, and uh, it, it seems to be so, you know, the, the, the connection to the, the 
from the, the voice of a team to what's on the field, I remember distinctly as a kid. It's really, it, it really was important as, as a kid that, that caused the love of baseball, I think, was, was Jack Rickhouse, was the, the way he, you know, painted, painted the, the picture. picture. And, but also just the, his knowledge of the game. And, and I mean, I learned quite a, quite a bit without that, without, and he, he, he didn't work alone most of the time, but there were times when he, was, he would just call a game by himself, uh, like, like Scully does. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was, it still fascinates me that, that, you know, that they, they can just elevate the game. You know, I think it's a great, I think it's the greatest game for a lot of reasons. Um, there's no clock on it. I think I, I liked, I liked the fact of, of the pauses in between the action. I think that's maybe even one of the more interesting parts of the game is when the ball is not in play and there's anticipation. You know, I hear a lot about now, oh, the game is too slow. And, and it, it is slower and there's, you know, when you use 51 pitchers in a game, it's going to be slower. So that is different. I get that. But the, the pace of the game doesn't bother me. Um, I, it, I'm enhanced by it, especially if, if stuff is on the line. It's just, and a great announcer makes, you know, fills in all those spaces. Do you have a, a favorite baseball movie? There's a lot. Um, but I'd have to say The Natural is probably my favorite. Yeah. It's mythic, uh, great characters. Uh, I like the fact that it's period, so it, it takes a look at that, you know, baseball back in a, in a more primitive time. Um, but it's just a great, you know, it's a great story. And, and, and to... recently I read the book, which is oh, very yeah, different. Oh, yeah, very different. I've heard that's very, very different. I'm scared to read the book because I've heard there's a very different ending it's that I very, very different. wouldn't want to hear, yes. But, uh, but still worth a read. But it's not, you know, it, it's not what we know of as, as that movie, you mm-hmm. know, that, that mythic hero. You know? It's interesting, you know, they, they, I haven't, as you said this, I realized that there is a Wrigley and a Cubs connection because Roy Hobbs goes and breaks the clock. And remember, right. Glenn Close goes to see him and she stands up and... Right. Yeah, and it nights at Wrigley today. Right, and all of that, yeah, that, yeah. that little, uh, the, like, soda fountain oh, yeah. under the L tracks right. that they right. eat at in her apartment. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, yeah, it's all And right. the, the music, the kind of... Uh, Randy Newman scored that. Right, you know, just the whole, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. It all works in that movie. Yeah. Gary, uh, maybe share a story about what it was like on the set of Office Space, just working with Mike Judge and, and kind of the whole essence of that reality well we you know everybody on the film we all were big fans of mike we and problem here yeah we knew what we were working on was really good Uh, but what happened was that was a period where dvds kind of peaked and yeah cable television uh, was was you know emerging as a, right. as a bigger power and Jennifer Aniston was his biggest star in the world uh, yeah the and, and 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 office space began to be played on a regular basis so all of a sudden it had an audience yeah they didn't happen to show up at the theater right. but they were people were actually watching it in groups I was told that you know leave work and you know, do their happy hour and watch office space and so then we found that we had some kind of a you know, if not, uh, you know, a success, a cult hit on our hands. And that was surprising, you know. I mean, who would think that, you know, would, we didn't think there would be merchandise spawned from this movie we were making. Yes. I mean, what are you going right. to, what are you going to make? Yeah. What are you going to do, have a bunch of red staplers? <laughs> yeah, yes. well, yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. You know, so you never know. <laughs> You know, you never know what a movie will, uh-huh. what kind of an impact a movie will, will have. Tell us about NCIS now. Your role on that has, uh, has recently, um, you're the new lead role on NCIS. Right. So how this, exciting uh, is that? Congratu- it's congratulations. I, I, you know, again, it was, um, you know, something that happened and all of a sudden was, was a reality. Uh, Mark Harmon, who had been on the show, the show's, but that's the other thing. The show's been on for, this is the 19th season, so it's unprecedented. But so far, so good. You know, I play a guy named, uh, he's an FBI agent named Alden Parker, who they introduce in the story at the beginning of the season, working with uh, or almost kind of getting in the way of the NCIS team on Mm -hmm. on the same case, kind of colliding with each other and, you know, kind of, you know, kind of arguing. Bumping heads. Yeah, arguing over jurisdiction, but they they work it out and, uh, you know. 
now he has a permanent desk there. Yeah. Well, Gary, it's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for being here. You bet. Uh, we're going to do this for the first time, a new tradition. We're starting this with you. We don't have a guest book, Gary, but we do have a, a guest ball here. Good. So I'd like you to, uh, to sign it. All right. And uh, there's a good cat to cover for you. And you'll be our first guest. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. You bet. Thank Hollywood you. and Ivy. Thank it's you. Wonderful having you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You Beautiful. Bet. All right. A great new tradition on Hollywood and Ivy, and thank you for being part of that. You bet. Thank you for having me. And thank you for being here. Hollywood and Ivy was filmed live at Universal Studios in Hollywood, California. Brigham Avery's wardrobe was provided by Richie Suits of Beverly Hills. Richie Suits, a perfect fit. Hollywood and Ivy is a presentation of Brigham Avery Productions.